Hello and welcome to lesson 4.7, which is looking at optimization problems. Now you may have done problems very similar to this in other math courses, specifically in Math 11. However, today we're going to be using calculus to try and find the maximum or minimum of a certain situation. Often you'll see things like maximizing area or minimizing volume or minimizing cost, maximizing profit, things like that. And the key to all these questions is you will have an equation that you can isolate a variable for, and then you will have another equation where it seems like you have too many variables, and you need to be able to plug one equation into the other. In order to find a maximum or minimum, you're going to be using the first derivative. So just a reminder that f prime equals zero or does not exist, and a change in sign means you have a maximum or a minimum. The other thing you can do is the second derivative test, which is check f double prime. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So if f prime is zero and f double prime is positive, that would make you a concave up function, which means you would have a local minimum. If you had f prime equals zero and f double prime is negative, that would make you a concave down function and x would be a maximum at that point, okay? So let's try some problems. So we have two numbers with a difference of eight. So I'm gonna say, let my two numbers be x and y. And so if I have two numbers have a difference of eight, x minus y equals eight, a difference, subtracting. It doesn't matter which order you go in. Okay? We don't know which number's which, but my two numbers have a difference of eight determine the extreme value of their product. So this is the max or min, we don't know which, of their product. So when x multiplies with y, okay? So their product is x times y. Now the problem here is I want the maximum of this or minimum. So in order to find that, I need to find where does P prime equal zero or does not exist. And then I need to figure out, is this thing concave up or concave down? And therefore, am I looking at a maximum or a minimum? Okay. So in order to do P prime, the problem right now is that I have too many variables here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange my first equation. I'm going to move Y over so that I have X plus Y. And then if P is equal to X times Y, this is the same thing as saying eight plus Y times Y, because I can replace my X with the eight plus Y. Now, once I do that, this is now a product with respect to Y. So I can write this in function notation. Now, if you want, you can distribute this Y into the brackets and give you eight Y plus Y squared. Now to find where this product has a maximum, I would need P prime, which is gonna be eight plus two Y. And I want to know where does P prime of Y equal zero? And that would happen where Y is four. Okay. So now the question is when Y is negative four, is this function, this PY function, is this concave up or concave down? So I'm gonna move over here. And so the question is, is PY opening up or opening down? So I need to find P double prime in order to figure that out. P double prime would be two. Now, I said that y was negative four, so p double prime of negative four is also going to be two, because p double prime is a constant. This means that p double prime is greater than zero, which means we're concave up, which means p of y has a minimum at y equals negative four. So it said, determine the extreme value. We haven't done that. We just determined that the extreme value is a minimum. Okay, so we've answered the second part of the question. We've answered 
this already. Is this product a maximum or a minimum? It's a minimum. And if y is negative 4, we can go back up to this value here, x, and figure out what the x is. x is 8 plus y, which would be 8 minus 4, which would be 4. And therefore, we can find our product. Our product is xy, which would be 4 times negative 4. So our product is negative 16. So the question asked us to determine the extreme value of their product. We did that. It's negative 16. And determine if this product is a maximum or a minimum. This product is a minimum. So step one, you're going to need two equations. You're always going to need to rearrange one of those equations and plug it into the second equation. Okay. Once you do that, you need the derivative, find when it's zero. And then you need the second derivative to determine if you're concave up or concave down. Do you have a maximum or a minimum? And then make sure you've answered the question. Let's try another. An open box is to be made from a 20 centimeter square piece of cardboard. by cutting out squares of equal size from the four corners and bending up the sides. So we're going to cut squares out of the sides here. Okay. And then we're going to bend up the sides to make a box. Okay. Now we don't know what size of the squares are going to be. We are being asked what size squares will produce a box of maximum volume. So I don't know how big these size, these squares are. Okay. And I want to know what is the maximum volume. Okay. So I'm going to call the, these, these size of the squares x by x squares, which means that the side length here, I don't know how long this is actually going to be. I know the total side length is 20, but I don't know how long the side length will actually be here. Okay. So I know that 20 minus 2x is going to give me my side length. right? And I'm going to call that L, okay, of my box. Now, I also know that the volume of a box like this would be, since all the sides are the same, it's going to be L squared times my height. And my height in this case, once I fold up the sides, should be X. Okay. Now, I said that L was 20 minus 2X, so my volume is actually going to be 20 minus 2X squared times X. Now, if you want to find V prime now, you can. I'm going to rewrite this as V of X. I would choose to expand this all out so I have a polynomial. So this is going to give me 400 minus 80X plus 4X squared times X or 400X minus 80X squared plus 4X cubed. And then I'm going to choose to find my V prime. You, could, you don't have to expand this all out. Um, you could do this uh, derivative using product rule and chain rule. That would work just fine. But I'm going to find V prime of X is equal to 400 minus 160 plus 12X squared. And V prime is going to be zero. Oops. V prime of X will be zero if all of this stuff equals zero. And then I'm going to need to factor this thing. So I can factor a 4 out of everything. I'm going to choose to rearrange this and put the x squared term first. So I need two things that multiply to be uh, 300 and add to be negative 40. Okay, so I'm going to have 4 times 3x squared minus 30x minus 10x plus 100. 4, 3x minus 10, minus 10, x minus 10. So I get 4 times 3x minus 10 times x minus 10. So in order for my v prime to be 0,
x must be 10 or 10 over 3. Now, if I think about this logically, okay, if I cut side lengths of length 10 out from my piece of cardboard, I'd be cutting 10 from this side and 10 from this side. I would have no cardboard left. So I'm going to reject this because V would be zero. My volume would be nothing. I would have no cardboard left. Okay. So I know that this should be the size of my squares to have a maximum volume, but I don't know for sure if this is going to produce a maximum or a minimum because I found V prime is equal to zero but that tells me I have a maximum or a minimum. The only way I know for sure which one is to do either interval testing for V prime or find V double prime and make sure that it's negative so that I have something concave down, which means I have a maximum. So I'm going to use V double prime just to check. Okay. So my V double prime, if I go back to my original V here, my V double prime would be negative 160 plus 24x. And so V double prime of 10 over 3 is going to give me negative 160 plus 240 over 3, which is negative 160 plus 80, which is negative 80. So V double prime of 10 over 3 is less than 0. Therefore, we are concave down at this x value, which means we have a max volume if the squares cut have side length x equals 10 over 3. Now the question asked us what size of squares, so we did that, and what is the maximum volume? So if we go back up to our volume equation, we can use this to find our maximum volume. So our maximum volume is going to be 20 minus 2 times 10 over 3 all squared times 10 over 3. And if we figure that out, um, we can use uh, decimals or we can um, leave this as a fraction. If we, so we have the squares have side lengths of 10 over 3. So we will get, um, if we do this, with common denominators, et cetera, we get 16,000 over 27 if we want to leave this as a common denominator uh, and a fraction, or we can say it's approximately 592.6 centimeters cubed. So in this case, really your V double prime is just to double check your own work that you found a right, the right answer. It makes sense that that will produce a maximum and not a minimum. If you had tried X is 10, that would be your minimum volume. The minimum possible volume is zero. So we got two X values, but we used logic to reject one of them. If you didn't use logic to reject one, what would happen is you'd plug them both in to V double prime and you would find that when X is 10, your V double prime is positive and therefore you're concave up, uh, yeah, concave up, sorry, and therefore you have a minimum when x is 10. So if you didn't do this part, like you didn't, you didn't think of it, or you're kind of like, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to figure that out in the middle of a test sort of thing, that's okay. It just means that when you do your v double prime here, you're not just going to be doing this one, you would also do v double prime of 10. And when you do this, you'll get a positive answer which means that that does not produce a maximum volume, but a minimum volume. Okay. okay. We're going to do one more question. So just a reminder before we do this question, the absolute extrema of a continuous function on a closed interval occur at the critical points or the end points. So if you can tell that there is a... Uh, interval on which you are testing, your absolute maximum or minimum can occur at critical points or endpoints. That was extreme value theorem from earlier in chapter four. Okay? So we're going to do two, basically two separate questions here. The sum of two non-negative numbers is one. Determine the sum of their numbers 
uh, determine the numbers if the sum of their squares is A as large as possible or B as small as possible. So we're going to be using the same two equations for these two questions, but we're going to find um, two separate sets of numbers here. Okay? So two non-negative numbers, I'm going to say let X and Y be the two numbers. And the sum of the two non-negative numbers is 1. So x plus y must be 1. Whoops. Now, in order for this to happen, I know that they're non-negative. This means that x must be greater than or equal to 0. x. Now, I also know if x and y are both greater than or equal to 0, in order to add them together to be 1, they must be less than or equal to 1. Because if x was something like 10, the only way that 10 plus y would equal 1 is if y was negative 9, but I was told that they're non-negative. So that can't happen. So the numbers have to be between 0 and 1. And what this tells me is that I have a closed interval. Okay. I have a smallest possible x and a largest possible x, and I know what those are. Now I'm also told the sum of their squares is what I'm looking for. So sum of the squares, I'm going to call S, would be x squared plus y squared. Now this is what I'm trying to minimize or maximize for part A and B here. Now I can't do that right now with both of these here, so I'm going to need to rearrange this first equation. And it doesn't matter which way you rearrange it, but I could say y is equal to 1 minus x. And then this would be x squared plus 1 minus x squared. And this would now be a function. My sum of my squares would be a function with respect to x. Okay. So as large as possible and as small as possible, those would be max and mins. We're trying to maximize or minimize. That means I'm going to need S prime. Now, before I do that, you could rearrange this and write it as x squared plus 1 minus 2x plus x squared, which would give me 2x squared minus 2x plus 1. This means that S prime of x would be 4x minus 2. S prime of x would be 0 if 4x minus 2 is 0, which means that x would have to be 1 half. So this means the max or min of s of x occur at my critical points, x equals 1 half, or my end points, which were 0 and 1. Now, the question is where? Which, which of these is the max and which of these is the min? So remember, when we were doing extreme value theorem back earlier in chapter 4, what we then did is we plugged these back into the original function. The biggest answer was our max. The smallest answer was our min. So we need s of 1 half, s of 0, and s of 1. s of 1 half would give me... Um, 2 times 1 half squared minus 2 times 1 half plus 1, which gives me 1 half. S of 0 would give me 0 minus 0 plus 1, which gives me 1. And S of 1 would give me 2 minus 2 plus 1, which also gives me, oh, 2, what did I do? Nope, also gives me 1. Okay, so this here clearly is my smallest answer, so this would be my minimum. These ones here would be my maximum. So my original question for A, we wanted to find as large as possible. So I was looking for my max here. So we said the maximum occurred, Sx is max, 
at x equals zero or one, right? Now I'm supposed to find the numbers that go together. So when x is one, um, we had that y was equal to one minus x, which would be one minus one, which would be zero. When x is zero, y is equal to one minus zero, which is one. So you can see here that when x is 1, the other number is 0. To maximize the sum of the squares, when x is 0, the other number is 1. So this is why it doesn't matter which one's x and which one's y. No matter what you do, the two numbers that go together here are 0 and 1. Okay, for your lar as large as possible sum of squares. Okay. For b, this was as small as possible. So this means we're looking for a minimum, and our minimum happened here when x was 1 half. Okay. And our sum was also 1 half, but we need to find the matching y. So again, y was equal to 1 minus x, which is 1 half, and this gives us 1 half. So the numbers are one half and one half. So for as large as possible, I get zero and one. As small as possible, I get one half and one half. And that is it for 4.7.